Welcome to Mainland, your local regional television station. I'm Tania Omar and some of the stories coming up in today's news. Tasman MP talks budget blowout, cost cuts and Golden Bay pharmacy change, scammers target the vulnerable and more. MP for Tasman, Damien O'Connor, was in Mapua this week to check out the wharf overspend and caught up with Chrissy Small. Briefly, $577,000 overspend. Do you think that's acceptable? Look, I, the, there are clearly some problems here with the management of the area. This is a little iconic uh, destination and it's going to grow. Uh, the council desperately needs to have a long-term plan that incorporates other areas of Mapua. Uh, you know, a person said to me the other day, we should be building a walking, cycling kind of village here. Um, and, and I totally agree with that. Uh, the bypass went in on the basis that we could create a better living environment here in, Ma in Mapua and Ruby Bay and the surrounding rounds. Uh, so we've got to actually adhere to that. Um, it's a shame that so much money has to be spent here and, and for you know causes that we and, and for some facilities that we're not quite sure uh, are good value. There's a lot of debate. We need a, a long-term strategic plan and we need to bring the community on board, explain what we're trying to do here uh, and that's we as the, that's the council and everyone I guess. Uh, it's all ratepayers money. Um, we need to be on the same um, sheet of paper here so that whatever money money is spent is not wasted and it heads in the right direction. Because process hasn't been followed and it all really kind of came home to roost when all the councillors were quite shocked when it was announced a week or so ago that that was a huge overspend, um, should there be some accountability for that overspend even if it is justified? Because it wasn't following procedure should there be accountability? Well there should always be accountability and I think um, you know across uh, as I say the corporate world, um, council and government um, perhaps there hasn't been the same level of accountability that people have expected uh, in their own lives you know if they make a mistake they have to pay. Uh, we do need to bring some more accountability into councils uh, when we're spending ratepayers money and the same with taxpayers money. Um, you know I, I, I think that's a, a fair part of any democratic system and it's up to the CEO the councillors to uh, keep the CEO in line, the CEO to keep all his or her managers in line. Really, really important. If people think they can walk away from um, you know, massive mistakes, then that doesn't send a good message out for other managers, uh, for councillors or for any of us. Now, just winding this one up, Damien, if councillors are landlord, should they be showing more favouritism to their own tenants than the tenants next door? Uh, you know, councils have um, a, a, a crucial role in places like this. If they are landlords and they are involved in commercial enterprises, they've got to make sure that they don't um, show bias towards their own enterprises against other small, medium enterprises. Um, you know, people find it hard work to make a buck these days and they've got to know that they've got a reasonably fair playing field. Nothing's perfect. Um, but when the council or central government steps in and, and you know, has monopolistic powers, uh, uh, then any abuse of that should be quickly shut down and that's effectively by the councillors, by the people um, who are ultimately responsible. We asked some local people if they were a paying tenant. As a ratepayer, what would their response be if a council as landlord hindered their business? Going and sitting on a chair until somebody opened their eyes and looked at what they are doing because that's stopping a person from having an income. Oh wow, I can I can't come with on that because if it's your own yeah. I have to, I I can't answer that one. That's quite a hard question actually, yeah. I'd like to pull it down but it, you wouldn't allow to do that, but I'll be naked if they have the fence up. The uh, council shouldn't be in private business. I'd feel upset. Um, I would because I feel the council should be for the people. Um, and I think I'd write some very distressing letters maybe and um, rally up some support and people who felt the same way, Some maybe some success stories about small businesses and things like that. Because um, yeah, we do need the support of our council and small businesses to keep our region thriving. I don't know what I'd do about it but it's a big, big bully offensive and that's, that's terrible. To block off someone's livelihood or whatever, doesn't matter if he lives in it or works from it or whatever. No. There must be a better ways around it than that. According to new figures released by opposition health spokesperson Annette King of the Labour Party, 
The current national government has cut $62 million from the Nelson Marlborough District Health Board budget since 2010. In real terms, Labor says that DHB suffered a $9 million loss in this last 2016 budget and that their figures show 4,175 people were denied operations after being referred by their GPs since 2010. The region also sits high above the national average of one doctor per 604 people, with 784 people per doctor. Chrissy Small spoke to Damien O'Connor about these latest figures. Well, what you've got to do with health funding is look very carefully at the figures. We've got population growth. We've also got uh, inflation pressures on health. It's like everywhere else in the economy. Um, things don't get cheaper. Um, and so what we've now exposed is that over the last uh, the period of the national government, we've had you know huge underfunding of health in Nelson Marlborough. Um, it's the tune of over $60 million, and that's why uh, we're seeing services squeezed, the DHB is trying to cut back here and there and people are wondering um, you know, why uh, they're not always able to get good health care and get access to it uh, when the government says oh there's more money now spent in health care, that's true but across the board because of population growth and because of inflation that's effective underfunding and they've been systemic in, in across the country on this. Right. Now we've got uh, the DHB looking at changing the pharmacy in Golden Bay, which could make it difficult for people to get their medication as a funding saving option. Look, I'm a bit confused. You know, the DHB was very quick to hand to the PHO management of the Integrated Family Health Centre in Golden Bay. And I think the, the facility and the way that the services operate uh, is great. Um, handing it to a PHO that has not traditionally managed um, aged care or managed secondary care um, is, was a new model. I don't think it's proving that it's you know, ideal yet. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, they might work on, on some of the problems there. But then putting into the mix pharmacy, I think is a bit ludicrous. They've got one pharmacy in Golden Bay. You know, it, it like many small businesses, struggles to survive. It offers a whole range of different things. Um, and I can't see why the DHB wants to gobble up take up that um, service and put it into the Integrated Family Health Centre there because um, it might seem logical. The reality is that when people want to go to get um, you know, pharmaceutical um, products, not necessarily prescriptions but other things that the, the pharmacists hand out, um, it's probably a lot more convenient in Tarkika itself. So one more you know, um, proposition here from the DHB that's got you know, people riled and uh, it shouldn't be working like that. We asked people their thoughts on a $62 million budget cut since 2010 and if they knew of anyone affected needing surgery. Well, I'm old, as you can see, and I, I think it's disgusting. I mean, they've got money for flags and they can find money for other things, but for DHBs, no. I mean, they're going to start charging your patients? Um, not good. Yeah, not good. That's a hell of a lot of money. With me having two uh, knee operations, uh, there's a lot of people out there who won't get them, like I've got them, and it's going backwards. 62 million. Wow, that's a lot of money. No, there's great news in the um, health board that um, you know, people's needs need to be met as well. And, and um, I think financially... Um, no, there's so much out there for the health board. No, just in, not in no, in education, in the children, and in, in the children's well-being, and as well in the hospital, and um, and where there's need to be um, other helpful funding. So, no, there should be more funding in this area because it's a great need out there, and you no know, people's well-being and and facilities and support for the agencies to go in and um, help these people. Um, no, because nutrition is a big thing for helping people with their health and their well-being. Because there's a lot of sicknesses out there because it's more poor nutrition out there as well and people that are suffering with mental health as well. So no, there's a real great big need out there that um, they need to think about um, funding in the health um, system and providing for to have more resources and that. Yeah. Mainland TV along with researcher Dr Catherine Strong 
provoked a response from the Mayor after challenging the Nelson City Council about the wording in their Code of Conduct, and in particular a paragraph that could essentially gag elective representatives. Nelson Mayor Rachel Rees included in her mayoral report last week the need for Council to revisit the Code of Conduct and reassess the use of this paragraph. Nelson City Council adopted the paragraph by modelling on an example from the Whakatane District Council. Chrissy Small put the question of the Code of Conduct that could gag councillors to Damien O'Connor. There's a professor that's been looking at code of conduct in councils and Nelson has taken on some uh, wording that means that it's going to be more tricky for a councillor to criticise their own decisions or the council's decisions publicly. What do you think about code of conduct and does do parliamentarians have to have something like that in their, in their little contract? Well, we've got standing orders, uh, and there's quite a thick book of, of rules of what we should and shouldn't do, and then we've got speakers' rulings that uh, interpret those. So, so we have to abide by a fairly strict code, um, but but not being able to criticise, you know, what has gone on wouldn't be in that. I mean, clearly, you know, if you're part of a team and a party, uh, then you have good, healthy debate. You do make a decision, and you get on with it. Um, you know, councillors have to respect that, but I don't think it's smart to have a code of conduct that says you're not allowed to speak your mind or your opinion but you've got to respect if you're part of a team then you abide by the team decisions so uh, yeah. I'm not sure what the code might incorporate but I am concerned that across the country um, in both the corporate world um, you know in cooperatives and, and and you know councils now in Parliament where you know we're being told to keep quiet and not to intervene I don't abide by that at all I think we have to speak our mind there are places where we should do that um, and, and places where we shouldn't uh, um, but as a democratically elected person, uh, I think that you know we have a responsibility to speak out on behalf of our constituents, um, and clearly not all of them will agree with us. Um, but that's part of democracy. If you don't act appropriately, if you're not doing your job, then people can get rid of you at the next election, uh, and that's good accountability. I'm not sure we have to be told what to do each and every moment of, of our jobs. We asked people in Richmond what they thought of the controversial paragraph that could gag elected representatives. I'm not sure about that one. Um, mm, no, I'm not sure about that one, do you? I think that um, it's when they try and muscle and muzzle people that want to get a, an opinion across and they're stopped from doing so. Well, I think you no. Know, everybody's got a voice, and everybody's got a right to have opinion. And um, you no, know, opinions are you no know, opinion. People's got different opinions, and they, and they should have a voice, and they should be heard, and they should be you no know, put in whatever they're putting out there. They they should be listened and heard. You no, know, they might have some good you no know, um, insights or wisdom or something to offer to the community. I think it's very poor because we're not on an even playing field for everyone. As ratepayers, they should have knowledge of everything that's going on. Being some councillors being gagged, or all of them, it's not a true line of what is actually happening in the uh, council chambers. It's ridiculous because that's why they got into the job, is to have their say, to push forward, to do what they can for whatever they're for, the, the people or whatever, but um, it's... <laughs> That's stupid. It's stupid. They shouldn't be able to have their say. Yeah. Oh, I think they are representing the people. They were put there by the people. They weren't self-appointed. And I think the, the people have every right to think what their council or who they voted for has comment on. No, I think it shouldn't be muzzled. Speak out. With the Nelson Giants games done for the season, all of the Trafalgar Centre and the surrounding Rutherford Park is a construction site once again. In the main stadium, the floor's being prepared to be sanded and re-coated at the end of the month. This involves punching all the nails to get them below sanding level. Sections of the ceiling in the main stadium are being reinstated and so are the facilities on the first floor of the southern end. The floor has gone in on the western corridor and on the northern building. Half the floor has been poured and the structural steel needed is currently being manufactured. Outside the centre, work is going well in Rutherford Park. 
The access roads, car parks and the plaza area are all in progress and landscaping has already started with some trees and other plants now in the large car park. Auckland Point school students also assisted by pitching in to help with the planting. Starting this week, the majority of Paru Paru Road will be permanently closed. The road itself, beyond the new entrance to the Trafalgar Centre, will be removed and the whole area west of the Mai Tai walkway will be levelled to bring it up to around the same height as the walkway. Those who used Paru Paru Road for parking will have access to a new small car park by the squash court. At the moment, this area is still to be sealed, but with wet weather has um, delayed that. A decision on the best approach for the replacement roof is likely within a few weeks. Council will decide whether to proceed with putting the new roof over the existing roof or replace the current roof cladding. The New Zealand Office of Ethnic Communities want people to be alert to a telephone scam operating in New Zealand which is targeting ethnic community members. The scammers pose as Immigration New Zealand officials and call individuals to discuss problems with their residency, suggesting the person may be considered an illegal immigrant. They then request sums of money to be paid or threaten deportation. This scam is currently being investigated by New Zealand police. Scams like this are targeted and can seem credible. Do not give out account details over the phone unless you made the call and you trust that the number you called is genuine. Ask for a name and number so you can call them back and check that number against a number you know to be genuine. If you suspect you have given away your credit card details to a scammer, call your bank. Meanwhile, another phone call is ringing in around the area with a pre-recorded foreign caller saying they're from Inland Revenue giving their name and that you have to contact them about undeclared tax before you are prosecuted. This is also a scam and should be ignored. After the break, we'll bring you the latest weather update and some events and happenings coming up from around the region. Are you looking for a scooter, walker, wheelchair, baby seats or push chairs? Then come in and see the Nelson Region Specialist at Mobility for You, 269 Queen Street, Richmond, opposite the library. We have a huge selection of scooters, walkers, wheelchairs and accessories, along with a free booklet guide. We also provide a breakdown service if you ever get a puncher or a flat battery we have fully equipped service vans to rescue you. Hi, I'm Robin Jordan and I invite you to call in and see the friendly team at Mobility for You, 269 Queen Street, Richmond, opposite the library. Hi there, Julian Toon, Waimea Telecommunications. We install and maintain domestic and commercial satellite TV, UHF Freeview and mainland TV installations in the Nelson Tasman regions. We specialise in Panasonic telephone systems and provide communications, Wi-Fi, IT and wiring for internet, fibre, computers and DSL systems. At Waimea Telecommunications, we also provide specialist electronic systems for features such as a security camera you can watch on your TV, visitor alert systems and much more. Improve your security and communication and entertainment today. Call us on Waimea Telecommunications on 021 47 2297 ytel.co.nz Why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000 but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979. So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer.
Sit and Be Fit is on at the Victory Community Centre Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10am at the Victory Community Church, 238 Upper Vanguard Street. School terms only. Fun while you get fitter, work at your level. For more information, please contact Shirley on 547 1433 or 021 121 8023. Victory 60 Plus is on Tuesdays at 1.30 through to 3.30pm at 238 Upper Vanguard Street. You can join in for cards, games and a cuppa. For more information you can contact Jan on 546-9057 or 027-4577-955. Stokes School PTA Fundraiser presents a fabulous fashion show and a night with advice on style and well-being. There will be a free goodie bag, raffles and cash bar. That's Friday the 17th of June, 7pm in the Stokes School Hall. Tickets are $25 online at lustercollective.com or through the Stokes School office. On behalf of the team here at Mainland Television News, thank you for joining us and we'll bring you the latest news and events from around the region again tomorrow. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air. We're the team at JCAR, right here in Nelson, 120 Hardy Street. Our shop is full of electronic items, including security alarm systems, electronic components, solar and power, electronics toys, sound systems, cables, and much, much more. Jacob. 120 Hardy Street, Nelson. Hi there. Julian Toon, Waimea Telecommunications. We install and maintain domestic and commercial satellite TV, UHF Freeview and mainland TV installations in the Nelson, Tasman regions. We specialize in Panasonic telephone systems and provide communications Wi-Fi, IT and wiring for internet, fibre, computers and DSL systems. At Waimea Telecommunications we also provide specialist electronic systems for features such as a security camera you can watch on your TV, visitor alert systems and much more. Improve your security and communication and entertainment today. Call us on Waimea Telecommunications on 021 472297 whitel.co.nz I'm Larry London from VOA Music Mix, bringing you news on the hour from around the world, plus music 24-7, from the latest hits to those classic favorites to jazz on Saturday mornings, plus much, much more. You can contact us by Googling Mainland TV or follow us on Facebook. Cheers from the team at Mainland Radio 1 and VOA Music Mix.
why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000 but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979. So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer. World War I was a defining period in our history, impacting greatly on the lives of people from the Nelson province. Memories of the First World War is an exhibition which will be displayed in a number of regional venues and is currently on at the Nelson Provincial Museum. We're the team at JCAR, right here in Nelson, 120 Hardy Street. Our shop is full of electronic items, including security alarm systems, electronic components, solar and power, electronics toys, sound systems, cables and much, much more. Jacob, 120 Hardy Street, Nelson.